This is Capital Ideas TV. Coming up on the show, the CEO of Avita Transportation. How new management has the company clicking on all cylinders? Contributor Fabrice Taylor on how to avoid another cannabis weekend. And the CEO of Drone Solutions Company, Devaron UAS, on striking a big deal with one of the biggest agriculture companies in the world. Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. Avita Transportation and Energy Services operates in a very specific area of the oil field services sector, and that is the moving of equipment, product, and materials related to oil fields operations. The company installed a new management team about a year ago, and they're seeing results with EBITDA up for four straight quarters and record revenue in the most recent quarter. Here's our conversation with the CEO of Avita, Ronnie Witherspoon. Ronnie, you operate in the oil field services sector, but you're in a very pure, specific area of the sector. So describe that. Sure. Mark Avita, our core business is moving drilling rigs. And what that encompasses basically is dismantling the rig after the uh, well has been drilled, loading the rig, hauling it, then erecting it on the new location where drilling operations can recommence. And if you look at our business, 90 to 95% of our business is U.S. based. Um, Strategically, we're positioned in every prolific shell play in the U.S. Um, we have 10 operating terminals in the U.S., one refurbishment terminal, and then we have three operating terminals in Canada. And if you look at the most active area right now in the U.S., it's the Permian Basin. We have three of our terminals in Permian Basin. Uh, we have to open the third one here recently due to the increasing demand for Vita services. And then if I look at our, the, <coughs> the other shale plays in South Texas, uh, the Eagleford Shale, we have a terminal in Pleasanton. And then East Texas to service the Haynesville, we have a terminal in Marshall, Texas. Oklahoma City to handle the scoop and the scat, the, the stack. And in the Northeast, we have two facilities, one in Martins Ferry, Ohio, and one in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And both of those are to handle and <coughs> provide services, rig moving services for the Marcellus and the Uinta Basin. Now you have competition in the sector. How do you differentiate yourselves from your competition? I think that's a really, really good question, Mark. And I, I, I would, if you, if you kind of backed up 10 years, I would really be hard pressed to come up with a good answer for that. But I think one thing that we've seen due to the onset of, onset of the shales in the U.S., it's become very, a, very much a manufacturing type business and, and lean principles start applying to it. And optimization is so important for the operators. And if you start looking at each, each piece, the drilling side, they've almost reached their technical limit. But now they're, now, now they're starting to really pressure test the rig moving side. And so anything we can do to enhance the efficiency for our operators, it obviously helps their profitability and their production numbers. And so we work diligently with both operators and drilling contractors to make sure that we evaluate and really pressure test in, in any MPT time that we have. And when we do have that, we document that and we take that as a lesson learned and we apply it to future wells. So let me just stop you there. MPT stands for? Non-productive time. So okay. All right. right, right. So anything we can shave and help reduce, even if it's an hour or a half a day or a day on the rig move, there's a lot of rig moving during the year, so it adds up to pretty big numbers for the operators. So we really differentiate ourselves that by providing that type of service, that type of documentation. And then on the safety front too, it's equally as important, and I think that starts with me. And that starts with my management being totally committed to, to, to running a pure safety culture and a true safety culture. And once that's established, it's much easier to define accountability. And it's also much easier and effective for them the employees to understand why we have established procedures and standards and make sure they're readily available for them and so we're executing at a high level. So you put that safety culture and that operational culture together and it really builds a true uh, you know, operational excellence and really helps differentiate us compared to our peers. These operators you talk about, your customers, you've got some pretty big names. Tell us about that. Yeah, we have a huge customer base and a very much growing customer base, if you will, in Canada. But... Uh, they're the drilling contractors and, and operators that we work for. Some of the names are that you obviously are very familiar with are H and P, Neighbors, Precision, Trinidad, Pioneer. Uh, those are the drilling contractors. On the operator side, it's you know Chevron, Shells, Apaches, Oxys, and Canna, Pioneer Natural Resources, Continental Resources, and the list goes on and on. Now, um, the energy sector rolled over in 2014. Everybody knows that seen to bottom in, in Q2 of 2016, and then everything starts going up after that. Uh, what, what happened at that time? What was the trigger? Did you start hearing from your customers that there was uh, right. suddenly demand was there? Was there a change in psychology? What was it? If you look at where we were in the quarter we just came out of, obviously we posted record revenue uh, level, levels, and if you compare that to the peak of 2014, you know, we were 20 million higher um, if you quarter-quarter comparison, right? Mm -hmm. 
but there were 1,900 rigs running then. Today we're at 900 rigs. So you can, you, you can do the math, right? Our activity has grown enormously. Our market presence has grown enormously. Our market share has grown enormously. And I think the catalyst back in Q2 when things were bottomed, when we brought this new management team together, within a 90-day period, we were able to turn the company into a positive EBITDA position where it had been a negative EBITDA for quite some time, Mark. And we did that because we brought in people that had strong ties to the industry and they were able to use those ties and, and really build this revenue that we built. Now, in terms of the financials, you, you mentioned record revenue in the most recent quarter. You've had four straight quarters of, uh, of growing uh, EBITDA. Right. So do you get the sense this is the, the, the start of a, a multi-year trend? You're on, this, you're on this trajectory now? Yeah, I definitely like the activities that we have. In fact, if you look at it, Mark, and you look at a more granular level, le- level if you look at Q3 of 16 and compare it to Q3 of 15, there's a $7 million um, year quarter to quarter improvement. If you look at Q4 of 16 versus Q4 of 15, another $7 million improvement. You look at Q1, similar comparison, $6.5 million improvement. You look at the most recent quarter we had, $9 million improvement over last year's same quarter last year. So if you look at that on an annualized basis, that's almost, almost $30 million improvement year over year. So it's quite a remarkable, quite a remarkable story. Tell us about your utilization rates and and how you've been uh, uh, growing that way and restarting power units uh, and uh, and that and that aspect of it. And also, uh, do you have do you sense and know that you have more pricing power now? Yeah, I think uh, let's start out with utilization. We're around forty percent utilized right now. That's up a great tremendous amount from where we were. Um, however, we still have units that aren't in our fleet and that need to be on the road. So I, I mentioned in the last earnings call that. We're dedicated to a refurbishment program and one that will start now. It's, it's underway and will be completed by the time we enter into 2018. So I really anticipate that that 40% shifts up to 60 to maybe 65% by the time we start navigating through 2018. And that will tremendously help us not being not using the third party support as much and using Avita, Avita services and increase the utilization for our assets that are on the road and on operator locations. Do you have any acquisitions in the pipeline? Because you grow organically, but every now and then there's a, an acquisition. We're always looking at them. Hmm. We're looking at several things right now. Um, some that are within our space, some that diversify side of the space. So um, if the right thing's there and there's a comp- compelling enough reason, absolutely we'll look at it. We'll take a hard look at it. And lastly, Ronnie, uh, some of the analysts that cover you give the stock big upside, triple digit, 200, 300%. Um, so make the investment case for, for an investor who may not know the company and, or may be looking at it and, you know, I, I may want to buy this, I may not. Yeah, sure. And I think if you, if, you, if you look at the story, it's a compelling enough case as it is, right? But then I think you look at three areas. If you look at revenue, we've shown that we can increase revenue without help from the market and with help from the market. If you look at our EBITDA performance, the numbers I told you about, pretty incredible. Um, and then if I look at our market share, while we've grown a lot of market share, it's still only 10%, right? We're still only at 10% of the market. So there's a lot of upside there. There's still a lot of torque in the story. And I think collectively you put those three together, I think it's a, it's, it's a great story. And I think I'm very proud of what the Avita team has been able to post in a very short period of time. We'll look at American Hotel Income REIT, which has had a rough go of it from a stock perspective, hitting a much lower levels recently. But it could be good news for shareholders because insiders are using this as a buying opportunity. The CEO increasing his stake by 50 percent through his investment firm, buying more than half a million shares. Then you've also got the president and the CFO buying stock in the company at lower levels. Our contributor, Fabrice Taylor, has received an enthusiastic response to his appearances on Capital Ideas TV. One viewer said to me that Fabrice helps demystify the market, he helps investors with strategies to profit, and he's willing to call out people and companies that deserve to be called out. And that's the case today, as Fabrice is here in studio to update us on the Cannabis Wheaton story. Fabrice, you were here several episodes ago talking about Cannabis Wheaton. Uh, that story has uh, evolved somewhat since then. Give us an update. And uh, uh, I understand you, you view it as sort of a cautionary tale for investors. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, uh, let's uh, recap the story. I mean, it was a, it was a financing done uh, at about a dollar. And uh, bankers and brokers and insiders had shares at one penny or one and a quarter cents. So it was a bit of a scandal. I was on BNN talking about it. I talked about it on your program as well. Uh, but what I want you to understand and what viewers should understand about this sort of thing is this is the kind of thing, it's an extreme example, but it's the kind of thing that goes on every day 
in on the venture market. I mean, the, the venture market has roughly 3,000 companies. And uh, I'd say 200 to 300 people in this country are responsible for putting 80% of these deals together. And they don't do it for you or me. They don't do it for investors. They do it for themselves. The typical venture model is, you know, let's, put a, let's get a shell, uh, get a bunch of cheap paper, um, and then they find an asset to put into it. Uh, the asset has to be promotable. It has to make sense. It has to be topical. These days you see a lot of lithium deals, a lot of marijuana deals, whatever is hot. And uh, they put the thing together, raise a little bit of money, and then you know the guys who are behind the deal, their names never appear. I know who a lot of them are just from experience, but they're gone. By the time you're buying this stuff, they're long gone. So I think the tale here for investors is, you know, the truth is that most of these companies are not worth buying. Uh, most of them will go to zero. Uh, most of them are run by, I think, genuine entrepreneurs. They're usually not involved. They just have a dream. They want to build a company. Um, and unfortunately, they get in bed with these promoter types who, you know, I'm not going to suggest that they're so cynical that they don't believe the company has any chance, but they're not sticking around to find out. And the trick with these things is you really have to align yourself as closely as possible with the guys who are in first. Unfortunately, that's usually not possible. So it goes to the, the greater fool theory where the retail investor is left holding the bag. Yeah, and again, getting back to cannabis wheat, and I mean, that's an extreme example, but I can tell you that the guys behind it, whose names will never appear anywhere, uh, they're running around bragging about having made $70 million on this deal. Um, I, I don't know if that's true. Uh, probably there's a lot of you know boasting there, but let's say they made half that $35 million. How'd they do it? I mean, if they've already made their $35 million, do they really care what happens to this company? I, I don't think so. They're already on to the next deal. Uh, again, you, you can buy the stock for a dollar, but they bought it for a, a penny. How does that make sense? And how, what are your odds of making any money when they've inflated the value of this company so much? Now, in fairness to them, they did raise some money. Uh, however, uh, the people who provided them with that capital, and this is the irony of all ironies, were not doing it because they believe in the company. These were largely institutions who were short the stock in one way or another and uh, covered their short by putting money into a financing, a treasury issuance. So that's the irony, they cash themselves up on a negative sentiment, mm -hmm. which is brilliant if you think about it for the promoters, and it allowed them to walk off with their tens of millions of dollars. But you know, if you're a shareholder and you get fooled by this, and you think all oh, institutions are putting, giving them tens of millions of dollars, well, you're wrong. So where are the regulators in all of this? Well, you know, they're there, but these people aren't necessarily breaking the law. Uh, they're certainly abusing other shareholders, and they know it, and they don't care. I'm not in favor of too much regulation because you do want to have a capital market that's efficient and that works. And keep in mind, too, that the regulators, some of them, I mean, the, 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 the exchange itself is a, has a regulatory mechanism, but they're conflicted because they make money from the, the more companies that are listed on the venture, the more money they make. So they do crack down uh, sometimes, uh, but uh, they have a conflict. The provincial regulators, well, you know, they're lawyers, and if you're not breaking the law, it's pretty difficult to go after these people, and it's very easy to get around the law uh, because there's just so many ways to do it. And when there's tens of millions of dollars at stake, people get very creative. The people behind this deal, by the way, are highly intelligent. I mean, clearly, they put together a brilliant scheme to enrich themselves. And hey, maybe this company will work out, but I have my doubts. We'll start with Ebert's Technologies, which provides equipment for broadcasters. And you're looking at a nice breakout here from lower levels. You see the stock hitting a 52-week high, breaking above $18. Conversely, we'll look at Cardium Pharma. You see here in the last year or so, it's had a pretty steady run. Nice looking chart, but then the FDA rejected a certain drug from the company, even though it's approved in other countries, including Canada. And you're looking at uh, Cardium dropping down to the 350 level, a 52-week low. A few weeks ago, we interviewed David McMillan, the CEO of agricultural drone data company Deveron UAS. Today, he's back in studio to update us on the latest developments at the company, which includes a deeper partnership with one of the biggest agricultural firms in the world. David can't say who it is, but this is significant for Deveron. Here's our conversation with David McMillan. David, we had you here a while ago. Uh, for those who didn't see that, interview, that episode, uh, number six. Uh, could you remind us what the Devron UAS uh, does? 
Devron UAS is a large-scale commercial drone service provider, so we're building a network across North America that allows farmers to collect on-demand, actionable data uh, using drones. Uh, so basically, we've seen a problem in the space of helping farmers use data to drive efficient decision-making to increase yields and reduce costs. Uh, it's difficult for them to go out and buy a drone, train themselves, do all this data, uh, and we provide that whole service across the country. So you call Devron up, we work on a program, and then we deliver that data in one seamless piece of information that helps them grow better yield, decrease the cost on the farm, and ultimately pour, put more money in their pockets. And remind us how you go about that, what your strategy is in terms of getting your, uh, your technology out there. Sure. So we generally look at the market as there's about 400 million acres of farmland in uh, North America. And there's maybe 30 companies that have relationships with all of these growers. They've been selling them seed or chemical, uh, crop protection, fertilizer. Um, so our strategy is to work with these long established relationships and kind of collaborate by providing our data to help everyone make a better decision uh, in that we're really partners with people that have been trusted in the agriculture industry, and it removes our ability to have to call up 25,000 farmers and convince them that what we're selling is very valuable. That would be tough door to door. Yeah, we found when we first started the company, that's what we were doing. We, were, we had this vision that you could monetize data collection for farmers using drones. And I mean, I probably called... I don't know, the first year, maybe 1,500 farmers in Ontario, and they were all really excited about what we were doing. It just was, there was no way for us to scale really quickly. Um, so then I connected with a couple of CEOs at larger farming enterprises and started talking about our vision. And, you know, all of a sudden these folks have a million or five million or 10 million acres under management. It becomes a lot easier for us to, to grow our products adoption when we can work with people that are already trusted in the ag space. Give us an update uh, on some of the developments uh, at your company because you you can't name the company, but you, you've signed quite a, a, a deal with a, a well-known uh, ag company. Yeah, and, and to go back to the cornerstone of our business model is to work with the leading uh, agriculture companies in the world and bring this data product to their, their customers. Uh, so we signed a, a pilot study with one of the world's largest crop protection companies. Uh, crop protection sells anything to protect crop on the farm. Uh, one of their p uh, key products is fungicide, so they apply that on soybeans and make sure that at the end of the season the soybean is harvestable and we can eat it and, and process it. Um, so these folks are looking at all sorts of applications to use data to help drive more efficient use of their product. Um, and these guys you know, have access to 40 or 50 million acres alone in North America, let alone uh, how much they work with people globally. So we think it's like, if you think of it, if we were uh, you know, selling detergent, that big step is getting in the shelf of Walmart, and now you're in front of millions of customers. This is one of those things for us that we're really excited about because we now have a truly trusted large enterprise that is using our data and helping their farmers make more efficient decisions. So that seems like it's an important milestone for your company. Are you finding that when you are looking to partner or, or sell your, your product that you're finding more and more understanding of what you're doing and more acceptance? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think in general over the last two or three years, like you know, $15 billion has gone into ag tech and drones from Silicon Valley. The problem is, is that nobody's solving this solution of scalability. Um, so by focusing on how you actually collect all this data first, um, we think we're, we're really ahead of the times. And every meeting we're going into, uh, you know, we meet with these leaders in, in the North American ag space and they say, finally, how refreshing. Like, you're, you're a company here that isn't focused on trying to sell us software, trying to sell us hardware, trying to sell us another pain in the butt that we have to deal with internally. You're managing that whole process for us. Um, and then we can work together to collaborate with the brightest minds in ag to drive decisions again at the end of the day that'll put more money in a farmer's jeans. Um, and that's our core value proposition, right? Unless we can increase yields or reduce costs, uh, nobody's going to buy our product. And we think that, you know, getting reputational awareness with some of these large players is, is really great. And it's exciting to, to see the enthusiasm from you know, the most progressive companies in North American agriculture. Your company is that rare microcap that actually makes money. Mm -hmm. So give us some of the, the financial metrics uh, that we uh, that uh, is uh, happening with the company right now. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually just filed uh, our Q2 uh, financials a couple weeks ago. And for us, it was, it was pretty monumental in a sense of uh, we had positive operating earnings. So for us, um, you know, we have 50% gross margins. We can see how that scales as we continue to get more users 
Um, using the data, we tighten our geographical network. Um, so our drones are driving shorter distances to do jobs. Um, and we think that, you know, we wanted to show people that this isn't some concept and five years from now we're going to be able to monetize and commercialize it. It's we have a value proposition that is very distinct. Um, people are using it today, and it's now just a question of going and getting these 30 relationships in North American ag that can continue to just scale revenue. Um, so hopefully I think people are going to see in the next quarter, we're going to see growth. Um, and then as we get into uh, 2018, we're going to continue to keep moving the, the needle a little bit further. And I think everybody in the drone industry has had this concept that farmers are going to buy drones. And we really are, I think, the only company in North America that is focused on the fact that farmers want to make more money. And data helps them do that. And they don't have the time to actually collect it themselves. So by, I think, focusing on the logistics solution, that's really going to drive the value proposition, which will then drive uh, you know, our financial metrics. You've touched on a few of the factors uh, already, but uh, give us the investment case for Devron UAS for, for a potential shareholder or a shareholder. You, you think there are sort of three factors that did make you compelling? Yeah, I think first and foremost is, again, uh, any time that a new company gets started with the opportunity of building a network, uh, historically, we've seen amazing opportunities for like an oligopoly uh, type market structure. And it's happened in the telecom business. It's happened in the Internet business. And it's the same thing we envision here. Like, you know, there aren't going to be five million drone service companies that are covering North America. There's going to be three or four that have the true uh, reach to solve this logistics problem, which is I need data collected in Red Deer, Red Deer Alberta, Fargo and, you know, southern Florida. Uh, that's really what we're bringing to the table, and that's something that, as you build that, it becomes quite a significant barrier to entry. Uh, number two, I think, is really this idea of gross margin. Uh, it's great that people can build huge revenue opportunities, uh, but if you don't make money along the way, there's really no end value for investors. Uh, so we've proven that already, and now it's just a question of like how quickly can we scale. Um, so we're really excited about that. And then I think number three is <laughs> investors are given a lot of the same products. So people are coming up with you know, widget 2.0, widget 2.1, widget 2.3. Uh, Devron is truly a new market. It's a new opportunity. It's data in, in agriculture. And precision agriculture has been a theme um, that I think a lot of people are starting to get really excited about. And for us, it's presenting people with a new opportunity that's something new. And you know, we really are the only company in North America focused on this market niche. And I think that's a really cool opportunity for us to be building, but also for investors to see you know, outsized gains as we execute on our strategy. From the heart of the financial district in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. To not miss an episode of Capital Ideas TV, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more great investment ideas through our digest and weekly note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks a lot for watching. Thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.